thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. For the gentleman sitting next to me is kind of a big deal. Uh, for anyone who is um, uh, pays attention to uh, American foreign policy and military affairs, uh, you know that ever since the attacks on this country on 9/11, uh, the United States has had to evolve. Uh, militarily and our intelligence community in many ways to meet the challenge uh, of this new enemy. And more than anyone uh, that I can think of, General McChrystal has been responsible for shaping that evolution and developing uh, the what I call the targeting engine, uh, which is what we have, I think, adopted as our primary method of uh, defending the country. So thank you for being here, General McChrystal. It's great to see you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for a too kind introduction. I always thought of you as a nonfiction writer, but I know you're <laughs> free to go into fiction now. Well, now, I know that uh, you, know, our, you were the commander of our special operations in um, Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, there has been, as I mentioned, a rapid evolution. Uh, I'm, familiar from writing Black Hawk Down with the way things were back in the early 90s. Can you give us an idea of uh, sort of the overall uh, strategy that's evolved? And uh, we'll get to specifics maybe, but also the uh, tactics that uh, you've developed. Well, not me, a, a group of people did, thanks. Um, take it back a little bit. At the end of the Vietnam War, as America has done other, at the end of other wars, the special operations units that are created essentially get gutted or they get disbanded entirely. There's a bias to do away with them. And in the late 1970s, American Special Operating Forces, when I first joined the Green Berets or Special Forces, they were really in pretty pathetic shape. And they were barely a shadow of what they had been at the heyday of the Vietnam War. In 1980, the mission Eagle Claw was launched to try to conduct a rescue mission into Tehran to rescue the American citizens who were held hostage in the embassy. And it failed. And it not only failed painfully, it failed for many reasons, but one of which is our special operations capability. While we still had people who were brave and strong and whatnot, they were not an integrated community capable of doing very complex things in deep. And that was a very complex endeavor. And so it failed. And in, from the ashes of that, there was a report called the Holloway Commission. And it recommended that we take a look at our capability to do this kind of operation and the structure to do it. Uh, I entered special operations a few years later as a young ranger officer. And I was able, and I, I try to tell this in great detail in the book because we, when you start to build a special operations capability as we were redoing in the early 1980s, the first thing you do is go find stereotypical special operators. Uh, typically guys with big shoulders, big knuckles, good shots, brave, and all that sort of thing. And that's important. You got to have that. But it's really the easiest part of creating the organization. Because what you have to do if you're going to do complex operations, you have to have a huge intelligence capacity. You've got to integrate that with operators. You've got to have aviation ability to bring this all together. And most importantly, you've got to have a culture. And that culture has got to be very mature. That's the word I'd use very carefully. It is not a culture of stereotypical Rambo kind of things, because that's not the way special operations succeed. That's how you lose. Uh, and so you have to build a culture that is evolved to problem solving and problem solving in which building teams does that. So what happened is we went up through the first, I was in the Rangers and then Joint Special Operations Command through the first, first Gulf War where we did scud hunting, hunting for Iraqi missiles out in Western Iraq. And we were getting better and better at what we did. We all paid huge attention to what Mark wrote so brilliantly about in Black Hawk Down. That was the Operation Mogadishu. We went to school on that experience, aided by the document that he had written on an operation that had gone very badly, but then had been essentially dealt with by the force on the ground with extraordinary courage. But a lot of holes in what we could do uh, came out. We came out as a fairly brittle force, i.e., if everything went perfectly the way you planned it, then you're in good shape. But when things started to go badly, as they so often do, how do you deal with it? Do you have the resilience to deal with it? So 
we started to try to fix that and to make it a more flexible and resilient force. We went up into 2001 after 9-11 and of course the first operations in Afghanistan toppling the Afghan government, driving out Al-Qaeda were some brilliant deep raids. And in Iraq with the initial invasion, same thing, working against a nation state. But where we found ourselves in really late 2003, which was when I returned to special operations, is you remember in the spring of 03, the invasion of Iraq went sort of surprisingly well or deceptively well. And suddenly things in Iraq started to go very badly in the late summer. Uh, we had a sense that if we could just arrest Saddam Hussein that that would potentially stop the problem. And what happened was we did. The force found and arrested Saddam Hussein and that didn't. What we found is what had grown sort of beneath the surface was a cancer-like network led by a guy named Abu Musab al-Zarqawi who had created an al-Qaeda related organization. It wasn't technically al-Qaeda at that point but it was a combination of foreign leadership and then frustrated Iraqi Sunnis and they were a network and they were not a small organization trying to do one or two things, they were trying to run an insurgency using what we call terrorist tactics. So suddenly the force that had been beautifully designed and honed to a fine edge for very precise but very episodic occasional operations was unprepared and unable to do the wider problem. It's like having a a SWAT team for your police force for all of Philadelphia, but in reality, if you can't cover the whole city and you can't do a lot of things, that one SWAT team can never be decisive. And that's where we found ourselves that began the significant evolution. That's where we really began to change dramatically. Right, in, in um, Somalia, I think Task Force Ranger had been there a month or two before the big battle that I wrote about. And during that period, they'd launched six missions. So the, pat, the pace was intelligence gathering, finding targets, planning and operation, sometimes very quickly, once that intelligence came together, and then launching a raid. Describe how op, what op tempo means and exactly how that applied in Iraq. It's very interesting because that's a, Mark's get it exactly right. There were a series of raids in Mogadishu, all happened a number of days apart. So you gather intel, you get it together, you make a decision. When you, you set yourself criteria to launch, when those criteria come, you launch. But it's a pretty centralized, pretty deliberate process. When we got in Iraq, we were originally doing that, and we would have this precise thing. And what we found is we were having an effect, but very narrow effect, very slow effect. And when we would go on a target, for example, we would go to pick up an individual, and there may or may not be a fight, if we captured him and his computer and his phone and documents and other things, we'd capture all those things. But the force, one of our small forces around the country would do the operation. Then it might take a day or two for them to send the individual back to our headquarters where we could begin effective interrogation. And the stuff that was captured would typically go in a plastic garbage bag. And it would be written in Arabic typically and then there'd be a computer. And it would come back and it would just, it would be 48 hours old before it got to the main headquarters. And then it would sit there because we didn't have translators to do it. And I, when I first took over, I went and I went in this room and there's a pile of this stuff that hadn't even been read or exploited as we'd call it, digested for intelligence. And counterinsurgency or counterterrorism is all about intelligence. Whoever knows the most wins. And so we had this incredible inability to digest information, process it, and then operate. We started to get where we could be a little bit faster, but we developed a system called F3EA for find, fix, finish, exploit, and analyze. That's a cycle you go through. You find somebody, you fix them in a location at a time now, you finish by capturing or killing, you exploit whatever you capture, you analyze that, and you learn from it. It's basically a learning cycle, learning and then action, and we would do that and we would go through that process, but it would be painfully slow because we were operating with different organizations, not all uh, organic to mine, and different agencies, intelligence agencies and whatnot. And this may surprise you, but not all parts of the US government work together seamlessly. <laughs> so, so here we are as this cycle, and we have these things, what we call blinks between the parts. And so one element would find a target, but by the time the information got to the people who were going to fix it, usually...